corruption that they're seeking on the ground that they cannot be compared with the workers at TSTT. They cannot be compared with the workers at the central bank, areas with whom we seek comparable um, treatment. So basically what we have had is an expression, a clear and explicit um, expression of the considered lack of worth of these employees on the part of the management. It may seem as though that, is a, that it might be a minor matter. But after all, it couldn't be more manifest than in the refusal to actually pay the level of salaries being demanded. But if there was any doubt in people's minds as to the outlook of the management, separate and apart from the fact of they being instructed by the cabinet not to go further. The management itself, their heart is in, the, in, the, in that unjust policy dictated by the management. In the kinds of statements that they would have made to people, such as what I referred to. Statements were made that you don't work hard enough. But that is the irony of ironies, because as we understand it, as we have been able to observe it, this organization is carried on the backs of the junior staff. If the junior staff were to follow the example, the work example of the management of this organization, there would be no work at the NID. If we were to really follow their leadership, right? So that is ever more painful, apart from the experience of economic denial as it is occurring, to be told such things, right? And I tell you, most frightening of all for me is the statement made to these people who were suspended, that if they don't like the conditions of work at the NIB, that they should very well consider leaving. Right? That was actually said. And I'll tell you, if the frame of our management is one that is intolerant of the norms of collective bargaining and the demands, even if militant demands, for improvements in conditions, if the, if the frame is one that that shouldn't happen and that people should instead leave, it suggests to me an outlook, a disposition on the part of our employers, a very well fireproof. That is what it clearly suggests to me, and I find that frightening. So when I used the expression a while ago about the NIV being something of a constellation of eagles, it's not idle statement that you are, are now beginning to, um, shall I say, cite the evidence. Really, the NIB management as it exists consists of a clique, a self-serving clique, the members of which have been elevated for all, all manner of other reasons except that of competence. And that reflects itself in the kind of service that the public receives. The NIB is not known for the best service, right? And unfortunately, the junior staff, they are in the front lines. They are the ones who have to do the interface with the public. So when poor service is meted out, the public take it out on the junior staff. The circumstances of the junior staff are that of understaffing. Contemplate what we're talking about when we talk about an inadequate number of people, an inadequate complement of people to do the work that is required. There's the stress of that in the first place. There's the inevitable deficit in terms of of, of service provision. There will be the frustration of the public unavoidably, and the public would react understandably and react bitterly, and the target of their reaction would be the staff. And I tell you, the staff are human. Some of them, as far as I'm concerned, are superhuman. If they don't know how to rise above these responses by the public, then problems of of social, of the provision of service will be compounded even further. The injustices are multiple. 
the experience is terrible, right? And all because of that self-serving plea. That sorry excuse for a group that calls itself the management. That is why we're experiencing what, um, these problems all around. Mr. Regis, it begs the question. A $21 billion company, $21 billion in assets. Why is it that asking for more pay is a challenge when the company clearly is in the black, it's not in the red, with $21 billion in assets? What's the issue? <laughs> what is the issue? That's a rhetorical question. Yeah, fundamentally, of course, to repeat, it's, it's the cabinet, huh? Um, who couldn't give, who couldn't care less how much we are in the black. But even before I come to that, uh, one of the comments, um, uh, as you, you raised that question, I'm reminded, I heard that was made to the people in meetings when they, where they suspended them. They were saying that the organization, they were saying to them that you're demanding higher pay. But the organization do exist to pay your salaries on it. The organization exists to pay the salaries of these poor pensioners, right? And that is their savings. In a way, I'm happy to hear them say that. Because for a long time, I thought that was lost on the accounts. When I heard the Minister for Social Development recently talk about the idle funds that the national insurance excess funds, and he said that in explanation of a government measure. You know, you would have heard a few weeks ago that pensioners were devastated, and a large number of them, because after having received increases a couple months before in their national insurance pensions, then just a few weeks ago, there was a corresponding reduction in payments they receive from another source, that is from the social welfare division, social, the so-called social um, senior citizens grant, right? I don't know if you might recall such an event taking place. And the Minister for Social Development and the people, I think that is the title of his ministry, um, he was on the air a lot trying to explain, trying to justify what happened and in the course of justifying he explained that what they did really was to adopt a measure that shifted the incidence of cost from the treasury that would have been paying the senior citizens grant um, um, pensions to the national insurance board so it was a clever strategy right and his reasoning for that is that what you have at the NIB is idle funds. So there's an inconsistency in expression on the part of authorities. When it suits them, suddenly there's excess and idle funds at the national insurance. And then when it suits their purposes and against the workers, suddenly these funds are to be guarded. When it suits the purposes of the very management who summarize into the, to the, the, the workers, um, in the pursuit of their triple digit in um, percentage increases, because our information, as we indicated last time, is that they're pursuing a hundred percent increases in their own salaries. It is as though there's no issue with it being funds held in trust for the insured public to pay pensioners. But when workers seek increases significantly less than the hundred percent, I assure you. Suddenly, that is raised as a, 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 a pretext, right, for resisting. But back to the question, the fact that you would ask, I need to emphasize why it matters not to the authorities, the authorities, especially at the level of the cabinet, walking through its that nefarious information in, um, interministerial team set up specifically to depress wages in the public sector. They don't care. And it is interesting that you would have made the point much earlier on about the fact that we have something of a global global audience. Our problems 
as we understand them are not to be understood in terms narrowly in terms of the wickedness of the world. The wicked, yes. But that is not the fact that, that is not the ultimate statement explanation. Nor for that matter are they to be understood simply in terms of the stinginess of the cabinet and the fact that they have an insensitive determination to depress wages in the public sector as it includes the NIH. It is true that they're insensitive, yes. But we are aware that ultimately the problems we experience in NIB and in the rest of the country as a result of the government are not at all dissimilar, if not for that matter they are very much the same in terms of the, the driving source and that is in something that is euphemistically called the international financial community, which really is an a, a decent name for something that has evolved, you know, in the context of all this globalization we have been talking about, where the global system is a more tightly integrated and tightly managed. And we talk, to, what are we talking about? What has come to be known as a transnationalist capitalist class that tightly manages the economic affairs in all countries. And a central feature of that economic matter is the depression of wage workers. And I tell you, for all the economic mumbo jumbo that has passed in the science and discipline of economics over time, it boils down to a simple principle. The less that is paid to workers, the more that is available to the economic ruling classes. And if there's any misgiving of that, of this, uh, 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 of the point I made, and any mis um, lack of clarity, or misgiving about it, one has only to look at the statistics, the worsening statistics of income distribution across the planet. Right? It is at the point, and I'm sorry I didn't prepare myself with the precise figures, but it's at the point, and it's already common knowledge generally, that the personal worth of some of the world's biggest billionaires, people who have connections, say, with economic interests such as BPTT and Trinidad, right? The personal worth is the equivalent of the national income of several countries combined. That is the level, the obscene levels of inequality on the planet. I can tell you, to narrow it back down, I mean, I thought that in explaining why, and that's my aim, really, to respond to your question, why is there this problem? I'm saying the problem is there because the management understands by us that the less we get, the more they get. Simple as that. But I'm also saying that the cabinet and, 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 and as well, they are determined to depress the wage levels. And not, this, not just the UNC cabinet, that happening since the PNM cabinet and so on and so forth. But I want to also locate that in the context of a globally integrated system that tightly manages the affairs of all countries that include Trinidad and Tobago. That the economic managers in Trinidad understand that they can't step too up far away, too far away from policy as dictated by them. What I'm describing is a state of modern day colonialism. For a long time, simply called imperialism. And a lot of people like to pretend that it works. But that is the underpinning reality. And to me, that is the most direct answer for me. Well, that was beautifully articulated, indeed. And so now it, it takes us to the next question, which is Can you see this? What's happening in the public sector as a dismantling of the public service? And I want to actually direct to this question to Constance Hercules. Do you feel, how do you feel, how do you all feel that uh, this is starting to look like, appear to be a plot, a plan, a ploy, whatever term or whatever word we wish to, wish to use to describe what appears to be a dismantling? of the public service so that when there are only contract workers 
at a workplace, then those workers don't receive the benefits that they should be entitled to, and of course, eventually, their retirement and all the other things that, inclu that are included in the package of public service workers. So how do you feel, how do you all feel about that in terms of if you feel that this is a plot, a ploy, a plan to dismantle the public service? Oh, I agree with you in that, yes, it is a plot, but this plot didn't just start today. If we go back in history to the times where we had economic depression, because we know it's an up and a down, and since the 80s, this has started. We saw it when we looked at the Dripa people, we saw what was happening, and what it was used at to, to show that, listen, it's not just about decreasing the workforce of the public service, it's about efficiency and management and cost effectiveness. That was shown as what the work was about. But when you look at what has happened through since that time to now, you recognize it is all in an effort to decrease the workforce and, as Terry said, to suppress the wage levels of the working persons within the public sector. And if we look at all that has happened now within the public sector, where we have, we have used technology to, de to decrease that workforce, and we say now that we bring in contract work. And when you look at what is written in the law with regard to contract work, for the public sector, you recognize it is not correct. Everything is just a fallacy. So you're hiring people on contract, but you're not following the tenets of what contract work should be. Because you have them as though they're working continuously. They feel as though they have tenure and whatnot, but they don't. And they have lost all their rights, as you say, pensions. They're, they're, they're working like a medical, medical services that they would normally enjoy. They no longer have that. The main thing, even as a union member, they don't have representation from unions as they used to because it was like, a, you know, everybody fell asleep and this thing happened as we, in the RHA and now you have to be fighting for representation of workers that normally would have been represented by the same union that has to fight for representation. And you have workers, like they're fighting against workers because everybody trying to secure, secure their contract. And when you look at what is happening, really and truly, you have more workers without jobs than workers securing contract. So uh, what Terry described there, with that imperialistic behavior, that is exactly what we are enjoying. So yes, we agree with that statement yes. you make there. It is all to dismantle the public sector as we describe the workers. Well, thank you for sharing concerns, Hercules. And again, I, I, I tend to tie the questions based on what you say and what you share. So then, as Mr. Regis expressed the imperialistic point of view and on a global scale, there is a plan to uh, suppress, as stated, the, the salaries to look good on a global scale. So then, I guess what's happening in my mind, I'm begging the question, which is, how are we going to win this battle? How are we going to together make this work? If it, there is a plan, a plot, a ploy on a global scale to suppress salaries in countries, for whatever the hidden agenda is, how does one achieve one's goal in shifting things to be as they ought to be from a humanitarian point of view and not to be treated as animals or slaves, so to say, with the slave mentality, keep all these people down so a few can have a lot. So then it's great that we're continuing to speak, it's great that we're continuing to talk, um, it's important for awareness, greater awareness, on a global scale, as I mentioned, PSA Radio is global. We are on the internet, and it's a global medium of communication. And so, maybe I can direct this question to Mr. Sedano, because I know you all are running short on time. You all are going to pick it today. So I don't want to keep you back unnecessarily. It's just about 11, sorry, 15 minutes after the hour of 11. I know you have to, you have to go shortly. So 
Actually, I'm being told to redirect the question to Mr. Terence Regis. Yes. So I guess what I'm asking is, if there's a global plan in place, as was stated, imperialism, how then does one fight and win this battle? Perhaps I could talk in terms of three things. Uh, really, in my view, is more than three. But um, I also want to be not run not too far from our concerns as well. Right? In the first instance, of course, there must be demands of awareness. Um, I'm not quite sure, indeed not satisfied, that there is a widely shared awareness Wi a wide, a, as wider awareness of the picture, the perspective as I advance it, of our problems being ultimately being ultimately rooted in the international. Um, unfortunately, as I move around, you hear a lot of workers and indeed some trade unionists, some trade union leaders, when asked to discuss the problems and explain the causes. We narrowly talk about it in terms of this or that regime. Either the PNM as you saw said or the UNC is the cause of it. Casting blame. Uh, yeah. Um, but casting blame at the wrong at the wrong sort of any blame at the feet at the wrong cause, you know? And, and it is misleading. Because, in the box, so yeah, because I see it shows up the illusion that look, the way we solve this problem is to get together and vote out these people. They need to be voted out, they need to be cast into the dustbins of history, yes, but that is not the, 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 the problem, the um, solution to the problem. Because all that happened, they play a sort of relay, a kind of musical chairs for an amount, right? These people are so close together in terms of outlook, you know? It's striking, for example, the way in which ex PNM ex-finance minister Mariano Brown for rising applause at the appointment of the UNC in the minister of finance, you know, and they have several other instances, right, and it marked the oneness of outlook. So the thing is a matter of awareness, it's a matter of, you know, there was a time I recall when in the trade union movement, you had research departments, and even apart from research departments, you had the leadership and activists taking an active, uh, taking a real interest in understanding and explaining things beyond the motivation of some incumbent and in, in understanding. The structures of inequality, understanding what is properly known as the workings of the political economy, understanding that there are broader forces at work than petty individuals, that these individuals are just agents that fit into a wider framework. So, understanding in the first instance. Um, in the second instance, it's a matter of Paying attention to some trade union basics. I don't know that the trade union movement has made much of an issue over the years in collective bargaining on the matter of the protection of real income. I know that what I've been observing is that people go seemingly without a sense of what it is they aiming for on the basis of what principle they go and they take a shot they try something to get a little bit a few percentage of points increase and if they could get two or three percent more than what the employer had been offering they throw their hats in the air in celebration. What has been happening in this country over time, and as I see for us in the negotiations, is that increases might sound big sometimes to the extent that they might be in excess of the known frame, the known benchmark set by the employer and employer class in negotiations, say 10%. 
these, these days 5%, right? These days 5%, right? And the union would go and perhaps succeed and get in, say, let me call a figure, 9%, right? And the fact that if the union and the workers would have met with so much resistance at going beyond 5%, the fact that they may succeed in getting past 5% to 9, 4% of pitch points up. There's a sounding of trumpets about having broken the bar. As if that is, as if they reached the promised land, right? But when you look at it, if the rate of inflation was 35% over the period, and it was in that vicinity, the 2008-2010 period, generally, that's the one we concern with right now. Others would have roughly coincided with it. What does 9% really mean? It means that the workers involved would be poorer than they were at the start of the contract period on the region. That's what we don't want to happen to us in the national insurance. Right? So that's why also we have avoided talking in terms of percentages because Percentages had the effect the, in terms of the mass consciousness of causing a certain kind of confusion that we were about. I think generally people would agree that at minimum, a salary settlement should maintain the purchasing power, what you were able to purchase. And if really you are to maintain that, then your salary settlement must reflect. Um, what the rate of inflation had been, what the degree of salary erosion had been. Uh, responding to the question about how do we deal with the issues um, posed by the threat of the transnational class in the context of the, in, um, the global political economy. And I'm saying awareness in the first instance, and I return to some, because it's inequality of fighting against, huh? and I'm saying that once you continue, to have declining real incomes, what we have in is deepening inequality, and by maintaining a real income, at least maintaining it, it really should be should, should be increasing it. Huh? But if at minimum you maintain it, then it is a major blow against the continuing sliding direction of inequality. Inevitably, however, to come to the third point, I want to make there are going to be limitations even as workers continue along that path. And these days, I hear a lot of talk about labor party and so on and so forth. And I think that the talk really is pointing in the right direction, do not fingering the solution in the most precise way. Because really what is being suggested is that the solution, the, 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 the solution to the problem can be a matter of each group of workers individually fighting the narrow battles and hoping to succeed, right? Mm -hmm. That was understood on this planet more than a hundred years ago when countries raised the slogan, workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. And such messages have been in different ways, some such understandings have in different ways been revived in recent years. You know, about 10 years ago, there was the so-called anti-globalization, transnational in character. Um, I recall that I think it was in, well, in the instance of the, the, the preparation for war in Iraq, you had the largest demonstration across the world ever. That died to some extent, but coming up in its place and really continuing in the same vein is the something that initially was known as the Occupy Wall Street movement. Again, really it is working class in character in the sense that it is reacting to the structures of inequality. It is not by accident that the first such uh, episode of the uprising was against Wall Street which really symbolizes the power of capitalism on the planet. And that would quickly spread after it erupted in, in the U.S. and Wall Street. to several dozens of other cities across the U.S. and indeed across the seas into Europe and in Australia and other parts of the world, hundreds of cities. 
I've been hearing much of it lately, but even if it dies, that movement as referred to the anti-globalization movement, then the Occupy Wall Street and the French Cities movement. But there's going to be further eruptions. And I think that they point in the way in terms of what was the in the sense that there has to be, a, if our problem is globalizing character, then the solution also has to be. But even before we become global, talking from our narrow, stand, narrow standpoint here, we have to achieve a certain labor unity in this part. We have to achieve not just that, but it must also have a political dimension. We must understand that we're part of a system, after all, if I talk about the cabinet and the ministerial team, I'm necessarily talking politics. But I ain't talking partisan politics. I ain't saying that the PNM must come and solve the problem because they have been part of it. It existed under them too. I'm talking about a different style of politics, working class politics. That, and when I say people talk about political parties and they point in the right direction, but it's not sufficient. It's not a matter of the formation of a political party by a handful of people and imposed by them on the working class. It is a matter of a developing maturity among the working class taking place side by side with struggles such as they are going among the energy because it is then that a certain intellectual flourishing of the and they come together and build such a party a political instrument from the ground up to address these problems and of course as I was suggesting a while ago make sure that in pressing for solutions, the scope of effort is international. Well then, thank you, Mr. Regis. Have since the negotiation or the contract negotiations started with NIB, what pluses or what successes have you had, if any? Extremely little. We have had, figuratively speaking, a penny thrown here and a penny. Um, indeed, when we're talking about what has happened. It is night we summit people sum it up in terms of five percent plus. In the sense that there have been quite frankly, I mean technically in the course in the technical considerations and negotiations, the management had um okay, yeah, a couple uh, what they call dollar increases of a hundred dollars um you know to be added to percentages, right? And the yield on that is really neg negligible. If I talk about $100 a day in one year and $100 in another year. That is why I started off saying that, figuratively speaking, it's like throwing an extra penny here and another penny here, right? And in the most summary fashion, it is neater to refer to the current situation as 5% plus. As if it are worthy of further expression, to say plus what? <laughs> I mean, so, um, so, so um, um, technically, I'd be a liar if I said there was no problem, you know. But in terms of talking substance and significance, I'm, I, I think I've already spent enough time um, answering the question, you know. Well, I thank you for sharing. And um, this is important. Eh? Uh, we are at Jontier right now. And this is a mark of the... <laughs> which I started off talking about the farcical nature of the, um, of the exercise for negotiations. Negotiations is something where each side examines exhaustively the claims of the other side. At least that's what collective bargaining is. Um, that has not happened up to this point in time in the sense that there have been quite several proposals offered by the association and a great proportion of these proposals remain outstanding for discussion but as a mark of how much how much this is a mock exercise the board has been intimating the readiness to break down the negotiations and refer the matter to the ministry of labor
right? And then what will happen when it gets there? Uh, what will happen, man? Quite significant. This is important. This is a good question. When it goes there, according to law, the minister has 14 days within which to resolve the matter. And um, if he does not succeed in bringing the two parties to agreement to achieve conciliation, in the successful conciliation in the matter, then he issues an unresolved certificate. And the first of consideration is within seven days, either party may take industrial action as the legally prescribed process. Typically, it would mean that the workers may go on strike. Strike, as you would know, is a protracted secession of work, right? Um, as the law has it for the last how much years, up to a limit of 90 days, as you would have seen in the TCL case, or the employer may lock out. Either party will take action to enforce the terms, right? And if neither party takes industrial action, then the matter goes off the market. I can tell you that the association has absolutely no interest in seeing the matter go to court. You would then appreciate that at this point in time, there is active consideration being given to the preparation of strike notice at the right? At that point, if the country is not aware of how essential a service the National Insurance Board is, it will become profoundly aware. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you for sharing that. So the um, negotiations that are taking place today, what time is that going to, the picketing rather, what time does that start? In the next three quarters of an hour, perhaps half. Okay. Right? So as we are very low on time at this time, it's now 31 minutes after the hour of 11, I'll just go around the table and ask each of you just to share your closing remarks and we will start with Mr. Richard Sideno, please. Okay, just to add to what Terry just mentioned, though we have had little increase considering negotiations and management as the movement, what we have shown, what we have seen is a vast increase by the otherwise quiet and meek NIB employees who have become very vocal in their disenchantment with what has been offered, their increase in working to rule, their militant action, and I'd just like to encourage our employees to continue the fight. It's a struggle. We have to struggle, but as the saying goes, if you don't get what you want, you get what you fight for. So we have to continue to struggle and to keep it up. Thank you, Mr. Sedano. That was Richard Sedano who just shared his closing remarks for today's interview. And next we've got Constance Hercules. Ms. Hercules, if you can share with us your closing remarks, please. May the workers at the NIBTT, mainly, let us join together and stand up for each other. Regardless of the fact that we work in a system where we have groups, let us not let those groups differentiate our needs and our objectives. Let us not fall to the hammer of the oppressors. Let us show our strength in numbers and in our unity. And as we sing, you know, that union song of our unity and our strength, let us exemplify. The struggle goes on for better working conditions, equity, and peace within the world, and to the larger public, because we all live in the community of Trinidad and Tobago. So it's not just within the workplace, but it goes, it's extended outward. Thank you, Ms. Constance Hercules, for sharing your closing remarks. And then, of course, we'll ask, finally, Mr. Terence Regis, just to share your closing remarks before the interview ends today. Very, very briefly, ours is a struggle, necessarily, for our own interests as National Insurance Board. But I also want to say, to the extent that we raise principles such as the maintenance of real income, it is also a struggle 
in assisting in certain standards in respect of the rest of the working class. So we see ourselves as carrying that flag as well. And as social security workers, and we mentioned, unfortunately, only briefly, the plight of the pensioners who were recently misled by the authorities. I want to say that we remain committed social security workers. And what is being manifested today is that the struggle for social security is multidimensional. It involves providing service at the offices, but it involves highlighting the plight of pensioners in the way that we attempted to. So it's, um, it's a very integrated and all wrong battle. I thank you, Mr. Terence Regis, for sharing your closing remarks. And I'd like to once again say thank you to you, Mr. Regis, to Ms. Constance Hercules, and Mr. Richard Sedeno for being willing to come back to PSA Radio today to share some of what's happening within the NIB, the National Insurance Board of Trinidad and Tobago, and of course, creating greater awareness as to some of the issues, ongoing issues, within the organization of the National Insurance Board. I thank you all for coming today. I also would like to say that I feel very inspired by your dedication and the admiration and the passion with which you have about your organization and the work that you do and the years of service that you've provided to the public and admire your, your passion and your drive to really, really um, create greater awareness locally as well as globally as to what's happening within your organization. I wish you continued success or success in this, in this in, in this, well, actually, in, should I say, in uh, stepping forward, continuing to put one foot in front of the other. Um, and we really all do hope that something positive comes out of all of this for the time and dedication that you've put and the energy and effort you've put into making something happen in a positive light in terms of the issues. So thank you once again for joining us at PSA Radio. It was a pleasure having you all again. Of course, please do continue to keep us apprised. Do feel, feel free at any point in time to give the PSA a call and let us know that you'd like to come back for an interview. We'd be happy to have you again at any point in time. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. I know I learn a lot from all of you whenever you come here and you share information. I'm somewhat blown away sometimes by some of the information that is shared. But nonetheless, it's great information and definitely it's information that we all need to be aware of. So once again, thank you to all of you. Thank you. And thank you for having us. Yes, it was a pleasure. It has been a pleasure. Yes. Thank you for coming back to PSA, PSA Radio. And you just heard from Terence Regis, Richard Sedano, and Constance Hercules from the NIB of the National Insurance Board and some of the ongoing issues within the organization. You've been tuned into PSA Radio, the radio station that continues to keep you informed and entertained. Keep it locked at radio.psatt.org.